So if you want to fuzz more complicated programs, you need to have some added complexity um, to make sure that you're focusing on fuzzing inputs that are actually likely to trigger flaws. So you know, if you just you could write a one-line fuzzer that just said s string variable hello, and yeah, that might crash a program because it's going to try inputting all sorts of different things. But um, if you're actually doing something similar to what it's expecting, it's more likely it's going to actually break something. So you might want to look at you know altering input lengths, command options, altering integers to test for boundary conditions. Uh, you might want to um, try command injections um, with about invalid characters and things like that. So the limitations of fuzzing is that it can be quite shallow um, because every time there's a branch in the code logic um, it can be hard to get your fuzzer to actually test that branch in your code logic and also every time there's a branch so that every time there's another variable that's like exponential growth in the complexity. So the first time you fuzz something, if you're sending like a thousand different tests that you're going to try and break that variable with, and then you've got the next variable, you know, it, it, it can take a really long time um, to actually search through all of the um, different things that your program's going to do. Um, so the, the actual complexity of source code um, is quite high. Um, and you might need to do a, a substantial amount of reverse engineering to actually r fuzz test a proprietary protocol. So say for example you wanted to fuzz test um, SMB communication like, set, like the Microsoft um, file sharing. Nowadays, yeah, that's fairly well documented, but back in the 90s that was kind of like you'd have to reverse engineer it to try and figure out how that protocol worked. So um, can be a lot of work to fuzz test something that's just like completely closed up. Um, you can use something known as evolutionary um, fuzzing to make sure that the fuzz testing actually tries to follow the different branches in the source code and focus on things that are likely to cause problems. Um, but that's kind of outside the scope of what we're doing. <coughs> so uh, if you do cause a stack smashing buffer overflow using a fuzzer, Usually what will happen is the program crashes. So you're doing your test and bang, the program crashes. And then you say, well, hooray probably. Like, yes, I found something that is probably a buffer overflow and I, I think, you know, you could probably write an exploit for it. So if you um, then run that program in a debugger, do it again. Um, you can basically you can look at the log file to figure out what the fuzzer actually sent that caused the crash. Sometimes the easiest way to do that is if you're doing TCP, just look back at Wireshark. What was the last thing it sent before the program crashed? You can feed that through to the program. Then in the debugger, you can look at the state the program ended up in, and um, you, you know the, we'll be able to see what happened basically. So just a reminder, we talked about um, a few weeks ago. So some pointers. Um, the, the stack is a place within the memory of a program that includes um, information on local variables and includes a return address, which is often what we're trying to overwrite with a buffer overflow. And there are some um, registers are um, basically little memory areas on the CPU. And some of them have very special meanings. So the EVP is a, basically points at the bottom of the stack frame which is like the current um, function that's running, say like in C code, the function. Um, so that points at the bottom of the stack frame. The ESP points at the top of the stack frame. So the little place in memory allocated for everything for that function. And the EIP is the address of the next instruction. Um, and that, when each time a function ends, that comes off the stack um, and gets overwritten onto the CPU. Those, those are the main things that you need to understand in, to, in order to understand what I'm just about to talk about. So because we can overwrite the return pointer on the stack, basically we can um, change what's in the, because the, um, the EIP comes from what's on the stack when the function returns, we can change that and therefore um, change where it's trying to jump into next for this for what the CPU is going to try and do next. 
Um, and that is known as stack smashing when we do that. Sometimes that'll just crash the program. So segmentation fault or some kind of access violation error or something like that. Um, but what we want to do is actually cause it to do something specific, run some code that we want it to run. So when it causes a crash, we can open, you know, look at the debugger, look at what's in EIP. Um, if it's an invalid memory address, then we've basically managed to succeed at doing a buffer overflow. So as a shortcut way of detecting this, typically you flood the buffer with A's and capital uppercase A's, and then it'll show up as um, you know, hex 41, 41, 41, 41, 41, because 41 is the ASCII uh, for an A, or uh, hex 41 is ASCII for A, um, which is, is it 64 in decimal? Um, so if we, if we ever see a crash, and the EIP is 41, 41, 41, 41, 41, then we know that we've got a good chance of actually you know, taking control of this program. So that's that's what we want to see. So if you can see this in the debugger, and you don't have to use um, Oli debug for this, you know, this is a debugger you can use. If the the EIP has that, then we know, uh, yeah, we can we basically got a buffer overflow, and we can write an exploit for that. So if we carefully craft um, the input, we can basically make the program jump somewhere else in its own log logic, which is known as arc injection. Um, or we could, so for example, if there was like, if it was testing certain conditions, we could just jump to somewhere else in the code and then it would be doing something else. Or we could execute our own shell code, um, like our own payload basically, and that's code injection. So we enter code, uh, for example, that starts a shell, um, and then into the buffer, and then we point the return address at our own code. If that was possible, then that would run um, our um, shell code. Uh, or we might point the return address at some of the program's code in an attempt to jump back into our own shell code, which will make sense in a second. So this is a simple version. You've got the buffer. It's you've put some stuff over it, and it's overriding all the local variables and all the other stuff. So a very simple buffer overflow might just overwrite local variables, and it might not be. It's not that exciting, but we've looked at examples of that. But then when we overwrite the return address, that's when things get. Um, get a bit exciting. So um, that's when we've got a stack smashing buffer overflow. And in an ideal world, we might be able to just basically point it straight back into the buffer. If onto this return address we overwrote with the memory address of this spot here, then you know, bingo, we've got our shellcode running. But that almost never works, and we'll talk about why in a second. So the tricky part is that we have um, the buffers move around every time the program runs, so we don't know what the memory address of that is going to be, because um, there's a security feature known as address space layout randomization, so that's been around for a while now, um, and most operating systems will have um, some form of address space layout randomization. It usually moves the stack around, but it won't move everything around, which we'll come back to. So the stack will move a little bit, or, or a lot maybe, and also the order that things happen in our program might change the stack slightly as well. So the stack's going to be a little bit different, um, so it makes it hard to know where to jump into. Uh, and that's where no-op slides or NOP slides come in. So a no-op or a NOP is basically a CPU instruction that literally does nothing. Um, so there, the C CPUs have a whole bunch of different instructions that you might tell the CPU copy from this place in memory to this place in memory, um, you know, subtract something from this register and all that sort of stuff. One of the operations is literally just do nothing. So you can tell the CPU, do nothing, 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 do, nothing, do a bit more nothing, 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 shellcode. Um, and therefore, if we kind of know where we're jumping into, but not exactly, as long as we hit one of those do nothings, hit one of the nops, it'll slide down, hence the nop slide, slides down through the knots until it hits our, sh our actual payload and then does the thing. So um, we would just need some way of jumping into that slide. Uh, and again, that's the tricky part because it still could be moving around because of the um, address space layout randomization. But that gives us a little bit more um, 
leeway of getting it close enough but not exact. So we, we've got a target that's a bit wider. So it redu re reduces the entropy, um, so it re reduces the randomness of, of what we need to, to guess, basically. Um, so what we really, the, the solution to the problem is basically using a jump instruction. So a jump instruction is an instruction that tells the code to jump somewhere else. And uh, often the way that we get around this problem is look through the libraries that are loaded um, into memory. So often they're like shared libraries like DLLs or something like that that the program uses um, that has a whole bunch of instructions, right? So if you're running, um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter. So you've got some program running, it'll load a whole bunch of DLLs, which is like shared code. And those DLLs, a lot of the time, won't be compiled with the, the layout randomization. So um, it, it's basically, if they all are compiled with layout randomization, it's very hard to write the exploit. Almost always, there are some that aren't. So you basically you look for the ones that aren't randomized. You look within that code that's loaded into memory. You find one that tells it to jump to where a um, to a location, and that's where you put your shell code. <coughs> so um, again, I'm going to I'm going to come back to that and clarify so that um, and that should hopefully become clearer. So don't worry, I'm going to come back to that concept in a minute. So if we are writing a Metasploit exploit module, they're written in Ruby.